our moderator for this one is Christina Shen. Uh, she's a VP at Bessemer Venture Partners. And uh, fun, fun fact about Christina, um, she's got one shoulder that's uh, an inch and a half lower than, another, than the other shoulder. Let's see if you can tell which one. Uh, please welcome Christina. Thanks so much, Max. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so excited to be here. Um, and I have the pleasure of introducing our panelists today uh, for our How to Scale Sales Orgs from Hypergrowth Sales VPs. Um, so our first panelist, uh, Shep Meyer, why don't you come on up here, uh, from GuideSpark. <laughs> Aside from a brief stint as a football coach, Shep has spent the past 18 years in sales and sales leadership roles, driving revenue, building world-class teams, and establishing uh, sustainable, collaborative, and winning cultures. As SVP of sales at GuideSpark, Shep is responsible for revenue development and retention. Uh, and a quick fun fact, he is clearly supporting Movember right now, so this explains his half-grown stash that he's sporting. <laughs> awesome, next we have Saad Shazad uh, from Gusto. Come on up. <laughs> Saad is the head of sales at Gusto, also known as Zen Payroll. He was the first sales hire at the company prior to Gusto. Saad was VP of sales at Din Cloud, a provider of hosted cloud services, under his leadership, the company went from zero to five million in revenue in less than two years. Saad was an investor at Norwest Venture Partners, a venture capital fund with five billion under management. He started his career at Goldman Sachs, where we actually knew each other, uh, and he worked on a variety of M&A and financing transactions, advising companies through strategic transformations. Uh, and fun fact about Saad, he grew up in Pakistan and moved to the US in middle school. Awesome, welcome. Uh, our next panelist is Emmanuel Scala from Influitive. Uh, as an off-the-chart extrovert, I've always been loved being in front of a crowd, engaging with customers, and building teams. I was, uh, or she was the first salesperson at two B2B software startups in Decca and Vertica. Uh, her last role was running the channel global, uh, channel globally at Sophos, where she racked up a lot of airline miles and she's managed all facets of sales from inside sales to enterprise to channel ops and enablement. Uh, and fun fact is that she's an adventure seeker and will be hiking Kilimanjaro this summer. Nice. Wow. Uh, and last but not least, we have Mandy Cole from Zenefits. Uh, Mandy has successfully built and scaled teams and revenue in the early and growth stage companies, including Living Social, City Search, Wells Fargo Payment Services, uh, as well as Zenefits, where she's currently now. She specializes in defining and implementing sales strategies to grow market share of new products or technology, develop infrastructure to scale, and develop programs to drive long-term growth through productivity and retention. Uh, as a graduate of UNC Chapel Hill, an avid college basketball fan, Mandy lives in the Bay Area with her husband and three kids. Uh, and fun fact, she's got uh, these three wonderful spunky kids, ages nine, three, and four months, uh, and is an avid basketball fan. Go Tar Heels! Awesome. Well, uh, uh, I'm personally very excited uh, to be upstage here today with uh, the four of you guys who um, represent quite a wide variety of customers, types, sales models, um, and, and uh, different size uh, businesses as well. Um, so maybe let's kick it off first, and, and each one of you guys have had to build out the sales orgs at, at your relative firms. Uh, maybe we'll go down the line and, and talk through how you guys have built that out and how you've built that structure. You want to start with me? Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> um, we'll save the best for last. The, um, the, the way I built the, the structure at Godspark, and, and if I think about uh, the purposes for the audience, I think it starts with really understanding what you're trying to accomplish and what model you're driving after. Uh, you know, for example, at Godspark, we started with a pure outbound model. Uh, when I joined the company, there were 10 people. We had no money for marketing because we were bootstrapped. And as a result, my first two hires were what we call RDRs, just to be a little bit different from uh, everybody else out there. They're SDRs, 
we call them RDRs, um, and we really needed to get that outbound engine going. Uh, so we started with uh, a focus on that. Uh, we ended up with a ratio of uh, effectively one-to-one, -one, where we were pairing uh, every quota bearing sales executive one-to-one -one with an RDR to make up for that lack of marketing. So that was really the key to how we started um, scaling the business with that outbound engine. Awesome, so I started at Gusto as the first sales hire. We believed in looking at our funnel primarily through the marketing lens first. We wanted to build a very strong demand gen function and as we started looking at the unit economics of one rep, here's what the capacity is, here's what the number of demos they can do, this is what the conversion looks like, we slowly started scaling the business. Initially, every rep was full stack. So they were doing their own prospecting, they were doing their own closing, and then they were managing those accounts as well. And this year, as we are now scaling past tens of thousands of customers, we have introduced a layer of specialization. So we have a sales development team, we have an account executive team that's closing uh, those prospects, and then an account management slash customer success team that is serving uh, those customers. We've got about 50 salespeople in the org today and looking forward to 5Xing next year. Uh, a little bit similar. So when I started the organization, there was a total of four reps, and now it's close to 40 in my team. Um, but we had a pretty robust demand gen. Um, we have an awesome marketing team, so um, SDRs were, uh, inbound SDRs were initially a big part of our strategy. So when I started, there was two AEs and two inbound SDRs. We've since um, grown and focused and segmented a little bit better, partially because when you, when you do the math, you realize that inbound is only gonna take you so far in terms of your growth. And with the growth that our investors are expecting, I knew I needed to add an outbound capability. So now I have on the SDR side, uh, seven inbound reps and eight outbound reps, and we added outbound just this past January. Um, so we scaled that up pretty quickly, and now it represents about 40% of our, our pipeline. Um, and then on the AE side, I just started to have to segment between, at the beginning, everyone kind of covered everything, um, and now I have distinct teams covering commercial, mid-enterprise, um, and, uh, and enterprise. And then we also added an account management function like you did to handle uh, retention, cross-sell, upsell. Um, that's how we scaled it. Very similar to these three. I think um, you know this year we went into a, a major growth pattern um, this summer, and that's when I joined early summer. And I think before then we, um, the two things that were that we focused on were more defining roles. So very similar. Um, we had an inbound team before and a very small out te outbound team, and we flipped that. So we now have a big outbound SDR team, um, which we scaled significantly um, the past few months, as well as then. Um, more, I think, tightening up how we align our AEs um, by market segment. Um, so total we have with SDRs and AEs close to 400, and SDRs are half of that. And it sounds like most of you guys started with inbound as, as most of the leads came in and then switched to the outbound. When did you start to know when you needed to make that switch? I, I keep a kind of a pretty detailed capacity model. Right? And, and I know my conversion at every stage. You know, I know how many inquiries I need to get to MQLs, and I know how many MQLs to get to SALs and SQOs and what my deal <laughs> size is, et cetera. And so I just did the math and figured out at one point, like, shit, this is not gonna work. Um, and there was just a gap between <coughs> the number I needed to hit and what was rolling up, and, you know, and that was it. And then I just started hiring outbound reps and you know, building the database, because our database was all from inbound, so that's not really a great database for outbound, so we hired actually a full-time database person to start building that out so that we could appropriately go outbound. Well, and SDRs can, can serve two functions. I mean, short term, it's obviously filling the top of your funnel and going out really finding those things, but longer term, it's also growth for your team. So if you plan on expanding your team, you know, that's a, obviously you want to develop those folks into your um, your future AEs. I know at Living Social, we found that they were our most tenured and our most profitable long term. And even though our cost of acquisition rose a little bit from having SDRs, our long term profitability was better at that time. Um, so you know, that's one of the things that I think we've looked at too. That and then they just have different skill sets too. I mean, I think your outbound is you know you're really teaching them the same um, the same foundation that your um, your AEs are going to have, and so when you transition them over, but it is for short term, you know, we did the same thing, it was capacity, 
how many, um, for our AEs, how many demos that they need to have in order for us to be able to translate those to customers. But longer term, how many do we need to start promoting at certain times so that we can build our sales organization? Definitely, and, and both of you are talking uh, about a lot of metrics that, that you regularly track. I mean, maybe talk through, so what are the five to seven or 10 key, 10 maybe too many, but well, what are the five or so metrics that, that you guys live by uh, in order to track the sales org? I'm, I'm happy to go first. Uh, so we think about the sales org and actually the business in general with three big questions. Are we growing? Are we doing it in a healthy manner? And are customers happy? And the KPIs we look at are an offshoot of those three. It's around revenue growth, sales cycle, conversion, lead attainment on MQLs. But if we can answer positively those three questions, we, we feel like we're in a pretty good place. Um, I'll, I'll share some thoughts on metrics. I think that um, it's, it's always interesting to, um, I, I'm a Boston boy, and I moved out here, and I love uh, living in the Bay Area because it's such an incredible hotbed of thought leadership. Uh, I think there's sometimes there's a risk there because you, you end up catching on to these like flavors of the month and, um, and you sometimes get distracted from what I would consider the basics. Um, so what I'd share with you, it's sort of like Saber metrics, right? You can get wound up in Saber metrics if you forget to look at the number of at-bats that somebody has. You look at their Saber metrics and they look awesome and then you realize they had 40 at-bats over the course of the season, right? And so for me, uh, oftentimes what I'll do is refocus on the basics. And when somebody's struggling, looking at, are they doing enough meetings? Are they, are, are they you know, what is the quality of those meetings? And really uh, forcing myself to get back to basics and get away from sales efficiency, customer acquisition costs, and some of these things that you can end up getting lost in the weeds and really going back to those basics of, how many times are they getting in front of the customers? Uh, what are those at bats and what is going into their pipeline? Yeah, I, I agree. I think you need to, for reps, you need to make, uh, you need to give them a playbook that's so simple um, that they can look at on a daily, weekly basis and say, you know, am I tracking? Because right? you don't want to wait till the end of the month or the end of the quarter and you don't want to look at these long term, you know, pipeline things. I mean, yes, I look at conversion, but that doesn't help with a new rep, for an example, except for maybe top of the funnel. Um, so I have, you know, posters um, on the floor that are like, you know, how many ops do you need to have every week? How many conversions to SQO every week? How many meetings? You know, how many deals based on, you know, what we know about our conversion um, that you need to have every month? And so it just becomes kind of obvious and you can look at the end of a week and you can say, you know, have you hit those numbers this week? Um, and, you'll, and then if you had a bad week, one week on prospecting, then you jump to the next week and backfill, so you never end up behind on a month. And so uh, I'm sure we've all been in that situation where, uh, you know, we've got an amazing first sales hire, a second sales hire, um, and then how do you translate, you know, their skill set and their learnings to, you know, the next 10 sales reps that, that you're hiring, bringing on the team? Uh, I'm sure you were actually that first sales rep that was killing it on the team, and, and then they had to figure out how to replicate you. I mean, talk through that. How, as you guys have each gone through that journey, uh, how did you soften that, that transition phase? I'm, I'm not sure I was killing it, for the record. <laughs> uh, there's definitely reps that have done much better than, than I could ever do. For the first sales hire, we often use this analogy at the company that the person should be able to drive the train while laying the train tracks, while directing where the train goes. They have to be a builder. They have to be an architect. For the next several hires, you want people who can take a repeatable process and make it much better. But they really should enjoy a wild ride on that train. Yeah, I, uh, I kind of think your first sales rep needs to be um, a missionary, right? Because that's... I mean, that's what it's about. It's about going out and spreading a mission. And then, you know, as you get more, you can, so there's sort of, a, I guess, a, a line between missionary and mercenary, right? And as you grow a little bit more, then you can, you know, have a little more mercenary, um, you know, in your, in your sales team. But it's, you know, it's codifying the things that uh, are working. You don't necessarily get it right on the first rep. I mean, I don't think, I wouldn't necessarily, my first rep, I wouldn't necessarily hire now. Um, because now it's, it is a repeatable process, right? And, you know, there's that kind of just missionary go out and figure it out is no longer there. We've figured it out. We've codified it. We have playbooks. Um, and so your 
you know, your reps need to be more coachable as you kind of go down and as you hire more because they need to be coachable to the playbooks that you've defined, whereas your first rep, you want them to be the one figuring it out. I'd love to weigh in on that, if yes, you don't please. mind. So th this, is a, this is a topic that I'm, I'm truly passionate about. And um, so I'll share a couple of thoughts that have served me well over time. Um, one is, uh, for me, it's sort of like making time to work out. Like you actually have to put time on the calendar and make it a priority or it will never happen. You'll wake up and be like, holy crap, two or three quarters have gone by and I haven't done anything to train or improve my sales reps. Um, so for us in the early days, it was setting aside lunchtime on Fridays uh, and um, it, it helps to set aside budget. So if you're working with a CEO, make sure you sit down and set aside some dollars. We would bring lunch in uh, and we would have Friday sales skills workshops. They would be self-generated. Uh, we would encourage uh, folks who were having success to actually teach sessions on it. But the idea was to step outside of your company lens, right? So it's not about working on your product or you know how you position, it's working on your sales skills. And it's reading a great book like you can negotiate anything and discussing it and, and applying those techniques or the challenger sale, or predictable revenue, or you name it, right? Um, and uh, uh, so, so that was sort of the early days, setting aside that time. Uh, once we got to a certain size, we were actually able to set aside some real dollars, and we brought in some great programs. Uh, we brought in win, Winning by Design by a local guy named Jocko, uh, who is a madman uh, and has been a great program. We brought in uh, Sandler, we're bringing in Franklin Covey. We're making a serious investment in it and a serious investment in terms of time and dollars, both with internal self-created curricula and external curricula. Uh, because the only way to improve an individual sales rep's performance is actually make them better at their craft and, and commit that time and energy. Yeah, we, um, I completely agree. We do, we do three days a week, um, lunch and learns. So Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Uh, Monday, we focus on product, so it's kind of our, our stuff, right? But there's demo training and other things. Wednesday, we focus on the industry, uh, you know, what's going on in marketing, what are the trends, you know, that, so they can be, um, you know, trusted advisors and they can add value at every interaction. And then Fridays, we focus on sales skills. Um, and we recently brought Barrows and um, John to do uh, training for us, and it was great. Just in case you thought it was only salespeople who are competitive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll one-up you. <laughs> um, I think it's also, I mean, in a high growth organization where you're scaling, so to your point, I mean, well, you want to, you know, you're hiring people that are joining because they also want to be able to give input. Um, and so you want to harness that in a way, though, that doesn't. So once you get a framework in place, and you know, like, this is our kind of standard process, as you grow, that's going to change because somewhere down the funnel, some metrics are going to change. You're going to have to figure something else out. Um, but so developing a f where everybody understands the framework, but then you can also organize and guide your team's input around certain things um, and figure out who's doing something different. How do you get them helping you solve a challenge um, so you can continue to reiterate on your process and get better and better at having a playbook um, and balancing those two things I think is also important. Awesome. Uh, that's super helpful. And, and along those lines, uh, I, what are some sales tools that, that you guys have leveraged yourselves? I mean, whether it be in the sales training use case, in the lead generation side, outbound, inbound, uh, call tracking or metrics matching. I'd uh, love to hear uh, what tools that, that you guys have leveraged. You want to start with Mandy? Okay. Um, well, at Zenefits, we're still implementing a lot of um, our and testing some new things. So we, um, I mean, like everyone, we use Salesforce, but we have started to use, um, you know, at the top of the funnel, we use Marketo. Um, we used to, um, and we're starting now to look at, we just implemented for um, SMB and for SDR inside sales to help us really with the cadence around um, making sure that we're calling and making sure we're prioritizing who we're reaching back out to. Um, and from now, from now, we need to look at the tools that will help them um, continue to mine, and then also, um, oh, and we also have Calidus for um, commission, but we're looking at some other things outside of that now um, to test on the next level. Uh, we're a little tool crazy. Um, I, I counted, we have 21 things. <laughs> Uh, some of them are not sanctioned necessarily, like I don't cut a check yeah, for 21 I mean, things. Um, my team likes to go out and test things and buy things on their own, and so there's lots of little apps that they use um, that haven't necessarily been 
vetted. Um, but so uh, the big stuff, you know, Marketo and Salesforce. Um, on the SDR side, we use SalesLoft, uh, both Prospector and their Cadence um, tool. We use, uh, we're big, big social selling, so we use um, LinkedIn, Sales Navigator, um, and um, God, what's, there's a whole bunch more. Uh, I use Insight Squared. That's for me, that's kind of my Bible in terms of um, my metrics. And then there's a lot. Uh, Evernote for notes, and there's a, a whole long tail of lots of little things. We like to test stuff. Um, so I think, I think my reps are testing three or four things that aren't even, they're all in beta right now. We're actually going through a consolidation ourselves. We really like to balance empowering the team leads and the sales managers so they can go out and, and get the tools that they think will help their teams be productive uh, versus looking at tools that are gonna be consistently used across the sales org. So in a similar fashion towards the top of funnel, we use Marketo as well. Interestingly enough, we actually started with Pardot, uh, ripped it out, and, and now we're using Marketo. And along that journey, we realized that if you look at the landscape of a lot of these marketing automation tools or sales enablement tools, there isn't a tool out there that's perfect. You have to think about your customer segment, you have to think about your sales methodology. For example, on the sales enablement side, we use a tool called Persist IQ, and it gives us the ability to really have quality conversations and personalize the cadence with our prospects. I'll, I'll weigh in quickly with a couple of thoughts. One is um, the, the best tool uh, that, that I've been able to use in terms of uh, sales efficiency, um, twofold. One is my finance department. Uh, and two is um, VPs of sales who have been there before me and are smarter than me and better than me. Um, uh, if you don't have a network like that and you're not working hard with your finance team to actually you know, create comp plan designs and think about what to measure and how to measure and why, um, then I would really encourage you to. It's uh, incredibly powerful levers. Uh, in terms of tools, I'll point out my man, John Parisi, who's sitting a few rows back there. John, you want to raise your hand? If anybody wants to get the real scoop on what we use, how we use it, and why, John is um, a genius. I'm really fortunate to uh, uh, be a colleague of his. And um, uh, he's implemented, uh, along with our sales ops team, InsideSales.com and ToutApp for our, our teams to use. Uh, we're big fans of both platforms. Um, and there are probably a host of other tools that I don't know about but cut checks for that you can, uh, you can ask John about for details. We don't use uh, LinkedIn Sales Navigator. We pay uh, a portion uh, to reimburse uh, reps who use uh, LinkedIn because um, we, we just see it as a balance of both personal and work expense, sort of like a cell phone. Um, but if my man Brian Walton back there gives me a discount, maybe I'll think about it. <laughs> Talk to you later, Brian. Well, uh, I'll answer my own question as well because as, as many times as investors, sometimes I feel like a salesperson as well as I'm, I'm outreaching to companies uh, and trying to have dialogues and conversations and tracking those people. Um, and so I personally, and, and I'm, uh, I'll do the shameless plug now, a uh, you know, big user of uh, Speakeasy, uh, which is a mobile first conference calling solution that you know I'm on the go all the time. I've got five more calls later today that I'm probably gonna take this conference and I can quickly uh, have a pinless dial in and into a conference call, see who's on the call, uh, you know, collaborate with my colleagues and then push that all back to Salesforce which is our back end. Um, and so uh, I encourage you guys to download that, speakeasy.co. Um, but I also use a number of tools. Uh, you know, I saw Kyle here earlier. I'm a big user of SalesLoft. Uh, I've used Persist IQ as well. A number of uh, people in the firm use as well. Uh, one of our portfolio companies, ClearSlide, we use to track our presentations. Um, and so, uh, and I, I suspect probably another half dozen tools <laughs> of, of, of people in this room that, that I utilize as well. Um, but I think that's one of the great things about this conference is we can discover and learn about new interesting tools that can apply to many different types of people. Awesome. Um, well, maybe I'll change the discussion a little bit. Um, and, you know, we're, uh, you know, all located here in, in Silicon Valley where talent is competitive and, and, and uh, uh, sometimes difficult to grab. Uh, maybe talk through that a little bit of, of uh, how you guys have scaled your sales orgs here or also maybe in other locations. Um, and the big question of compensation. How do you think about compensation for your sales reps? Do you want me to start? Please. Um, this, is, this is a great question because it's front of mind. I anticipate for ev everybody in the audience, I, uh, as I was walking up to the green room, I probably overheard three conversations on this topic. Um, we think about a couple of things. One is um, the, the people that, that we want to attract and I find are, are your best contributors long term 
are the people who buy into the mission of your organization. Uh, and and uh, if you haven't spent time thinking about what your organization's mission or purpose is, then I would encourage you to do it because that can attract people and that can have value just like dollars can. Um, the other thing that we think about is making sure that we are uh, living by a mantra. Uh, everybody on my leadership team is more focused on the success of the people that work for them than on their own success. My success is an output of the success on the peop of the people on my team. And, w and, and it's not glib, it's not sound bites, that's not empty air. When you're really, really focused and invested on that, that carries a dollar value because it means that you're taking people and putting people in stretch roles, giving them stretch assignments, exposing them to the companies or opportunities that otherwise they wouldn't have, and you can put a dollar value on that. Um, so, so I think those are some things to think about as you, as you think about that uh, war for talent, which is very intense, uh, especially here in the Bay Area. I completely agree. The reps definitely have to buy into the mission. This is something that we're really proud of, but out of the 50-person sales org, we have had zero turnover in the last two years. We think about compensation as a lot more than just the dollars that are going to come into the bank account. Compensation is important. We live in a world where it's a materialistic society, so we believe at paying close to market. But our commitment to our reps is around three things. We're going to give you autonomy, so you will have the ability to manage your own book of business. We will give you mastery. We will help you with professional development and personal development. And most importantly, we will show you the purpose. What is the impact that your work is having on the business goals? And that commitment has worked out very well for us so far. Um, echoing, you know, the mission obviously is critical and understanding your profile, I think, of your rep that you're looking for and really digging on, uh, spending a lot of time thinking about that and what's the culture you're looking for will play into comp. I mean, specifically on comp though, um, you know, there's a lot of big numbers that are thrown around in terms of OTE and, you know, you see people get swayed by, oh, well, they're going to give me X or they're going to give me Y. I, I'm, I want my reps to hit their number. I, I want them to over, you know, I want them to earn a lot of money because they're, you know, because they've gotten into accelerators and because they're overachieving and they're feeling good and it just breeds this culture of success and, and winning. Um, and so I'm not going to throw out huge OTE numbers and then have a bunch of people who can't hit quota, um, you know, because I have to pay for it because you do have to think of a cost of sale, right? So instead, I'm going to, you know, go to market. Um, and I'm going to make sure every single person is overachieving and, and hitting their number. Um, so that's, that's my philosophy on comp. But the other thing that we've done that's um, a little innovative, and it's because of what we do for a living and what Influitive does. So Influitive is um, advocate marketing software. Um, and so I actually have a portion of my comp tied to advocacy, which is something there's, I wrote a blog post on it on LinkedIn. So if you want to check that out, you can. Um, but I think sales is changing pretty dramatically, right? And the role of the salesperson is not just to bring home the bacon and then kind of walk away, right? There's no more, you know, drive-bys. Um, and so the role of a salesperson is to bring in good revenue. Um, and good revenue that's not going to churn and good revenue that the, you know, the company and the, um, the users and the buyers are going to become advocates. Um, they're not just going to buy the software and use it, but they're actually going to go out and spread the word. Um, and so I have a portion of my comp tied to advocacy. Um, so as you know, they're looking for that quality of business, and they get they have this long tail of continuing to get. It's not huge, but continuing to get paid um, as those advocates, you know, do advocacy, right? As they're spreading the word about Influitive, um, we continue to pay them. So that's something unique that we're doing. Can you build upon the business? Um, yeah, I think that there's a couple things, and again, I go back to. <laughs> when you add a lot of people at one time. Um, I think backing into one of the things I don't think we did as well um, earlier this year is exactly what you're talking about, which we've now flipped on its head, is actually being really upfront and honest and more almost telling people like, look, you can do this, you can make this, but this is what it's going to entail, right? And we should sit down and talk about, is this what you're looking for in a role? Um, because everybody now has the kegs and the free snacks and the everything else, right? Um, and everybody loves that, according to Glassdoor. But, um, but everybody has it. So, <laughs> um, so I think it's really about finding, you know, making sure that, you know, for us, our on-target earnings match, is it simple? 
Um, is it something that they can directly see? It's tied to our revenue, and they know it's only two or three things. They know how they're going to make money. Can our managers coach to it? Um, because I agree that developing people, and that's something that we've identified as the, one of the most important things too. And then you know, from, an, from their perspective, they care about, okay, you told me this is what I can make when I hit my goal. Can I, is it feasible to hit my goal? Can I make that? What are you doing to give me the tools that I need to, to do my job? And then how are you gonna invest in me and develop me? I don't wanna be in this role. I see that there's a career path. It, what is the career path? How do I get there? So you know, I think we've spent the last um, few months really defining all that out so we could be very clear about that. Um, and I think that that's helped um, then people, and then you have to go back to, and then once you get past that piece, like do they actually, like, this is your day to day, this is what you're selling, this is what you're talking to people about, are you passionate about this? Like, Can you understand what the person on the other side of the line is dealing with every day and how this is solving that? Because if you don't get that and you don't care, it's gonna be really hard for you to be successful. That definitely makes sense. Well, changing gears a little bit, I'd love to hear about your most difficult sales pitch that you've ever had. I'm not starting. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'll start. Um, I mean, listen, we've all had our share of hard deals and well-fought battles and that kind of stuff, but I actually think the internal sales pitches that I do every day are the more difficult to ones, team. right? <laughs> um, yeah, so, I mean, whether it's negotiating my number, um, you know, or, um, you know, or selling, you know, the vision to the team or recruiting, you know, that rock star that you're trying to recruit. I mean, I feel like my most difficult sales are the ones that I do every day as a matter of course, right, in, uh, in trying to, um, you know, continue to keep the, fun, you know, the team motivated and continue to hire the best people I can. All right, Chef, I'm going to put you on the spot. Right. <laughs> Let's hear a real one. Yeah, well, so uh, we were prepped last night and I thought of two really difficult sales calls. One uh, is personal and that was convincing my wife to marry me. Uh, I, married, <laughs> I married up and that took a lot of doing and a lot of, a lot of groveling, uh, but it worked out. And um, that's a story for a different stage. Uh, the, um, pro probably the most difficult sales call happened uh, really early on. I was uh, 22. I had just gotten promoted from inside sales to outside sales. Uh, I went to, uh, flew to Pittsburgh, which was my territory, a very glamorous territory, and um, I had a meeting with the CFO of Mellon Bank. I don't know how the hell I got it, but I had a meeting with the CFO of Mellon Bank. Uh, I got to the Hertz thing at the airport, and they wouldn't give me a car because I was 22, even though I had already <laughs> signed the waiver. And uh, I, I'm usually very good at like maintaining mellow with you know people that are in that situation, but I went pretty ballistic. They ended up giving me a car. I was late to the meeting with the CFO of Mellon Bank as a 22-year-old. I walked into the presentation, and at the time, we were trying to convince companies to uh, webcast their quarterly earnings calls. This was in 1999. It was way before the SEC required it. In fact, many companies at that time didn't even have a website, and it, God knows that the CFO that I was talking to had no clue uh, what webcasting was. I think that he thought I was from a bank because uh, the company name sounded like it might be a bank. And um, he looked at me and said, son, I'll tell you what, the only time that, I, uh, it basically said, I am never ever going to allow anybody to listen to my call unless their name is Morgan Goldman <laughs> <laughs> or you know Merrill. Get the hell out of my office. And he kicked me out, it was about, and then he turned his back to me and went back to his Bloomberg terminal. The meeting lasted about five minutes. It was an absolute disaster, and it's one of the best sales calls of my life, right? And the reason is because the learning lesson I took from that was that a snot-nosed, punk-ass 22-year-old who didn't know shit about anything could actually score a meeting with the CFO of one of the most powerful banks on the planet. <laughs> and so that, that lesson has stood me in, in good stead, but at the time it didn't. At the time it didn't really feel very good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I must say that that is probably the best answer I've ever heard to that question. And now, who wants to follow? <laughs> <laughs> if, if you're going to make me, uh, I, 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 I'll I follow would. it up. <laughs> I, I completely agree that some of the internal selling is is the most difficult. We talk about a concept a lot at the company that everything in life is sales. Our CEO is selling his investors 
on why they should continue to trust us. He's selling the employees on why they should show up to work every Monday. I'm selling the sales team on why they should believe in my ability to set their quota, that I have their best interests in mind. So everything in life is sales, and, and I do agree with you on the white front. It took me more than one call, but it worked out. <laughs> I, I guess, I, I mean, my worst sales call was one where I just wasn't prepared at all. Um, you know, and I walked in thinking, you know, this was actually with Monster. I walked in thinking that their revenue, this is years and years ago, but walked in thinking that their revenue was all about, you know, consumers searching for jobs. And it turns out that, you know, their revenue is all about recruiters, um, you know, looking for, for candidates um, and just got it all wrong. I mean, just had it, you know, asked backwards. Um, and, you know, when they told me that you had it all wrong and you don't understand our business, I mean, same thing. It was just one of those, you know, major wake-up calls. Right, that you learn when you're young, when you screw up, um, you know, about doing the research and doing the prep. And, you know, we ended up getting the, the deal, but at a discount, and it was long, hard fought, and it, could, it shouldn't have been. Uh, um, I mean, my, I have an internal, I think internal is, when I think about things, especially when sometimes you're selling things that on a spreadsheet don't look it's hard to account for, but the people management side of the business, you have to be a little bit like, you have to trust me that if this happens, this will happen, um, and that's sometimes hard. But I think earlier in my career, when I was at City Search, um, I had had a series of roles and um, had moved back out to LA for a corp dev role, and the CEO had said, hey, we're buying this other little company, and maybe if we buy that, you could also go and run it, this other ticket company. Um, and I just, I took that, and I just started this other role, and you know, there was a function, there may have been some adult beverages involved, and <laughs> I took it upon myself to say, hey, we're buying that company, so what about me? And he said, you know what? My whole life, I've gotten roles because I put my head down and done my job and done more than people asked me for and always looked at the way, and always looked at, you know, and almost did that job before I had it. Why don't you focus on the job you just got and make sure you're doing that, and you'll always be tapped to do something else. And so, you know, it was a great, I did not do a good job selling myself in that minute, but it was a great life lesson for me about, you know, you get the job because you're already trying to doing the job. You don't get it because somebody gave you a title. Awesome. Uh, well, one final question, uh, and, and uh, I know we're almost out of time, so, so let's do a rapid fire down. Um, but what do you guys think is the future of sales technology? I mean, in, in the next five to ten years, what are some predictions that you guys may have? Um, I'll start. I, I, I've said this before um, in a previous interview. I think that the era we're entering is, is what I would think of as the era of sales humanization, right? The amount of information that a prospective buyer can find out about you, about your prices, about the inputs <laughs> to those prices, about your reputation, both personally and as a company, like the playing field is just unbelievably level and transparent compared to how it was. And I think that that human uh, element and, and that connection with the buyer uh, uh, on things like mission and values is going to become more and more important, and technology is going to enable it. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think that the last decade was about marketing automation. This next decade is going to be about sales enablement. We haven't seen as much focus on sales reps, and I think a lot of companies out there, especially from a VC perspective, you're probably seeing a lot of pitch decks around how do we get sales reps to be more productive. There's certainly going to be more automation. Predictive analytics will become a lot better. Lead scoring will actually work, uh, hopefully, <laughs> over, over the next couple of years. But we think of a world five years from now, uh, think about Amazon. Amazon is putting together an analysis on your purchasing behavior. And they're trying to, to know what you're going to want before you want it. And they're going to send it to a distribution center near you. That kind of algorithm can be applied to sales. Yeah, I think things are going to kind of come back full circle. We've been in this, you know, is sales dead and automating everything and automate your emails and automate your voicemails. Um, and I think while all that data and all that prediction and prediction lead scoring and all those things are going to help um, arm the sales rep, right, at the end of the day, you know, it is that sales rep having that conversation, um, picking up the phone, um, you know, kinda, I think our best tool is the old school tool of the telephone. Um, and so I think things are going to come back full circle, and we're going to see a lot more focus on the quality of the conversation um, and, you know, kind of de-digitizing um, a little bit some of the things that we do so that we can have those human-to-human -human interactions again. Yeah. 
I agree with that. I think it has gone to, I mean, I don't think any of our products really would sell themselves without somebody talking to them. So as much as our teams want to email and want to do all these things without trying to talk to somebody, the reality is if we could do that without them talking to somebody, we probably wouldn't have them. Um, but then it would be hard to do things where you know, a lot of um, been moving to is it's, you know, you want to deepen that relationship with the customer. And so I think being able to use technology um, to make that simple back to our team. Um, so some of us are saying about the predictive analysis, but really start to tee up, hey, here's customers and here's your customer's life cycle and here's what they need. But that that person is having that conversation. We're not depending on that to be self-service to them. Um, because we're just overrun with technology anyway. So starting to use it the right way and combining it, relationship powered by technology. Definitely, well, uh, as, as uh, someone who spent a lot of time in this space as well, uh, I, I look forward to hopefully fund a lot of more sales and technologies in the future. Um, and so I, I guess thank you again, everyone, for, for doing this panel. It's, it's been a lot of fun. And, and can we get a round of applause for our panelists? Awesome. Thanks so much, guys.